Bill. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fran Taylor, and I'm Vice President at Todd's Inheritance Historic Site. And we'd like to welcome you, whether in person here, thank you for coming, or if you're watching online live or on YouTube at a later time, we'd like to welcome you and uh, invite you to view other uh, talks that we've given. Uh, this is part of our monthly lecture series, and today we have the pleasure of hosting Mr. Kevin Garrity. Kevin is the Vice President of the Dundalk Patapsco Neck Historical Society, and he has a really interesting presentation on the hist from some history on the peninsula, and he's going to be talking about, of all things, bootlegging. So let's welcome Kevin. Thank you. It's, um, it's always good to be here. I enjoy this place very much. This was a talk I gave at the Historical Society about three or four years ago, and uh, Rob Zachar was one of the people who saw it. And um, he asked me to give it to his community group, which I did. And Jim, the parking lot Jim, uh, loves it. Is he not here? He must still be parking cars. He does love it. He told everybody. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> this is a story that I had no idea about. Um, I found it by accident, and very few people know about it, um, mainly because of the passage of time, I guess. <coughs> How many people were here last month when Glenn Johnston gave this talk? Glenn Johnston gave a talk about fishing shores and pleasure shores and things that, oh, yeah, yeah. in the area. At the turn of the century, most of Patapsco Neck was either farming or recreation areas, bars, beer pavilions, and such. There was a continuing conflict between the farmers, who were mostly Methodists, and pay alcohol. They didn't like the idea of their employees getting drunk and not being able to show up for work on Monday morning. And some of the German immigration had come in of course, Germans like their beer. And uh, conflict resulted that lasted probably 20 years between the farmers and the beer hall. Um, one of the beer people uh, is related to um, Mary Contraband in the back. <laughs> Her grandfather was a guy named John Du Bois. And John Du Bois had a hotel which has been reno being renovated for about the last 10 years on uh, North Point Road where Du Bois Avenue is. John Du Bois was all always getting in trouble for selling liquor on Sunday. A bar could be open on Sundays, but you couldn't sell liquor. So <clears throat> they had laws against what they call screens, which means on Sundays the bars had the doors had to be open and so the cops come and laugh and see everything. And Mary's great-grandfather fell afoul of that on several occasions. Mary's great-grandfather was also found to have uh, mash on his property, which was used to make illegal liquor. Mm -hmm. But compared to Mr. Pelletzer here, Mary's great-grandfather was a piper as far as that's <laughs> Mary and Bob are a couple of my oldest friends. It's really a pleasure to see mm -hmm. Along with her being a prop for John the Boy. Mm -hmm. So, all along what is now Hollywood Avenue, down from the foot of Hollywood Avenue, which was on what is now Clinton Street, down to North Point Road, was bars, beer pavilions, things like that. There were constantly stories about people being found dead on the road on Monday morning. Don't ruin my picture, Gene. I'm gonna give you this. It's actually your picture. <laughs> Gene is the president of the historical society. I'm the vice president, so. If I do something wrong, I'll get in trouble. Where was I? On Halliburton Avenue. 
on Halliburton Avenue. Um, if you were found drunk. Anybody old enough to remember Campbell's Hotel? Campbell Tavern? It's on the parking lot of what is now Squires. Um, the coach house, which some of you might remember, was uh, back off the road a little bit. Campbell Hotel was in front of it. Campbell Hotel was a notorious place for drinking, carousing activities. Um, there was a very famous murder case that took place right outside of the Campbell Hotel in 1909, but uh, I'll tell you about that later. Going so anyway, one of the places, one of these pavilions and shores was called the Japanese Fishing Shore. And Glenn Johnston probably mentioned it when he was uh, here earlier. It is right off of Cove Road that comes down to the Beltway, off in North Point Boulevard. On your map, this is a map from 1898. You can look at it later. It's right here. Part of the Japanese fishing shore is where Rob Zachro lives today. Say hi, Rob. <laughs> it was founded about the time of the Civil War. There were uh, 50 rich Irish and uh, German young men who wanted a hunting and fishing preserve. So they bought 50 acres of land down there. And by, this was around 19, 1860. By 1920, only three of them were left alive. They had set up their purchase so that instead of going to the heirs when someone died, there were 50, then there were 49 owners, 48. And another thing that had happened around 1920 was a sewage plant went in upriver from the Nevada, which cut down on the hunting and fishing. So they wound up selling it. And most of what I'm going to talk about took place down there. Which brings me to this gentleman. His name is Henry Bletzer. He was born in 1888. His father was a fireman. His father was one of the heroes of the 1904 Baltimore fire, one of the first responders. His name was John. He was on duty for 48 straight hours. Came from a good German family that lived on Bond Street in Bell's Point. Something was wrong with Henry, though. Henry grew up there. When he was 20 years old, he got into boxing promotion. It's a very famous boxing promotion. And I'll put, put this up. You can look at all these boards later. So you have a cork script? No. No, I think it's a twist off. Oh, is it? Yeah, you're in luck. She's lying. You're good. No, I have some games. <laughs> so Bletcher was kind of, I would say he was kind of like the Don King of his day, um, constantly going through the country promoting his fighters, talking about the refs being biased, um, always trying to get an edge. He had two guys who were very famous. This guy is George Chain, left-handed boxer, K.O. Chain. He fought for about 25 years, long, long career. Him. 
And this is his other great fighter. His name is Kid Williams. Real name is John Kachenko. He was a Ukrainian. And he was, come back. One of these actually lost. It's a, I haven't found out which one. Do you, um, do you want to keep your talk and I'll figure out which one you have to? Oh, would you? Yeah. Well, actually, I don't need you yet. <laughs> Sorry. So, Kid Williams here actually won. Are you good? Are you good? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, Bantam weight title, early 1900s. Fletcher was very well known as boxer, uh, boxing promoter. Very popular guy. He had owned a uh, what they call a rat skeller on Baltimore Street, which is part of what is now the Baltimore City Police Headquarters. Uh, in that block. Um, Sports writers loved him. He had opinions on everything of the day, and he was just a very gregarious, um, wonderful guy. Something happened. Around 1917, 1918, he's still only about 30. He starts getting in trouble with the law. One of the things he loved to do was race. He was, um, he was in the fast cars. And there's a 1920, I believe, there was a road race on Old Frederick Road outside of Ellicott City <clears throat> where they evidently hit speeds over 100 miles an hour, which is amazing in this thing. They didn't catch him racing, but they caught him later with $6,000 in his pocket, which was the proceeds of the race. So a couple of things happened in 1918 that radically changed this area and the country. When the U.S. entered World War I, the Army was looking for a place <coughs> to ship trucks overseas. They bought some land from the Canton Company, which became known as Camp Halliburton. They were at Fort Halliburton. Now it's a Halliburton Industrial Park. Moved into December of 1917. In April of 1918, Congress passed a draft act. And what people didn't know until the draft act was passed was that part of it prohibited alcohol sale within five miles of a military installation. They found out afterwards. <laughs> so five miles from Fort Holliburton is about where Wise Avenue runs in the North Point River. So all of those establishments had to close. Wow. Mm -hmm. Five miles from Fort Howard is probably runs a little bit past this, but there weren't many establishments there. So it created a huge crisis in the alcohol industry. It created a huge opportunity for Mr. Butts. Chain again. And kid now you can come back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> Kid Williams, Do you, 
Yes, I do. Okay, now. Now I need Now I need you. See, when I was just running the same three pictures on the loop, I was going. Now can I pause this? house still exists. It's on Bletzer Road, which is inadvertently named after Hoover. He bought this house, had it built in 1919. If anyone, it's in the 8300 block of Bletzer Road. One back there. He also bought most of the land from, you can look at on these maps later. This is Norris Landfill here, and he owned most of this land all the way back here, including the Japanese shore. January of 1920, Prohibition became law. And as I said, it had already been in effect de facto in this area for a couple of years because of the military. But anybody who's ever been in the military knows that what soldiers like to do just about as much as anything is what? <laughs> One of the first times Henry Bletcher came to the attention of authorities was they pulled a U.S. Army truck over on Shell Road, part of Hollibert Avenue. And it was full of drunken soldiers and about $5,000 worth of liquor. And the drunken soldiers said that they'd gotten the liquor from Henry Bletcher. What they did, and what Henry Bletcher was doing, was having ships come in, dump the liquor off on the shore and then he would handle distribution. These soldiers came down, waylaid his guards, tied them up, stole the booze, and them at the home. <laughs> so they were very happy to tell the cops where they got it, because it you know, cracked it open on the way back. Went to Henry Bletcher's house, he says, I don't know. I didn't know there was anything on my land. You know, they couldn't pin anything on A short time later, I did have a couple of years. This is a picture of Fort Hollibird, 1980. It's pretty cool. A short time later, several of Bletcher's employees showed up at Camp Hollibird, randomly beat up about five of the soldiers, and told them never to come down to Bletcher Shore. <laughs> Also at Holliburn, in the back of Holliburn, was an old distillery. It was called the Federal Distillery. And a couple of the buildings from the Federal Distillery are still there. Um, a company called Nolet. Do you know Nolet's gin? They used to make gin. Mr. Nolet had to go back to Holland in a hurry in 1918 under circumstances I'm not sure of. But he left a bunch of booze in, in his warehouse. And the soldiers found it. They found a couple of the stills that were working and got them back in order. So they were also manufacturing rules <laughs> on their own at home, what they were getting from Bletcher. So Bletcher had many ways of getting his liquor. One of them was by water. And I'm missing one of my minutes. This is a map of the area from 1929. 
can come up and take a look at all of this later. The harbor was from time to time patrolled by, by revenue boats. Enforcement of prohibition wasn't uniform or strict most of the time, but this was a dangerous way to come up. The way Bletcher's people came up would be scoot between the islands here and come up back over. So they they dropped the liquor off there, but there were a couple of times. One of them was in 1920 with the soldiers. Another was in 1924. They found another cache of liquor on this property, which is an ownership of. And in 1928, they found a huge cache. After the 1924 bust, what they would do would be they they would take the liquor and put it in buoys and drop the buoys off, and then his guys would go out and fish in it. <laughs> <laughs> He also made his own stuff. Rob Zachro lives on part of the property that he owned. And Rob was. <laughs> what were you, were you mowing your lawn? Yeah. And he, all, he fell into a hole almost. And it was one of Henry Bletcher's stills. <laughs> well, it was what would have been empty, right? <laughs> Rob also, the property Rob also lives on, some of the longtime residents are descended from people who worked for him. Uh -huh. so they had some stories too. So. His parents had a house on Bond Street, which is where he grew up. Maybe I can find this picture. And this is 722 Bond Street, which you notice is a vacant lot. <laughs> okay. that's, that's George Chandler. Sure gets around, though. <laughs> I still don't know which one it was. I can do it if you want. Okay, here. Who's that? I'll just be your remote. This is 722 Bond Street, which as you can see is a vacant lot. It's been a vacant lot since about 1936. The reason it's a vacant lot is that in 1924, uh, the Revenars got a tip and raided his parents' house, in which they found 500 gallons still with the heating units attached. And the 500 gallons still, according to my internet research, would have been about 18 feet by 14, something like that along with the heating units. Taking the still out of the house weakened the property so much that a few years later it had to be torn down. So that was, his brother-in-law got busted for it. Henry wheedled out of that somehow. The only significant time he spent in jail, I said he imported it, by, by C, he made it himself, and he stole it. In 1922, there were a couple of distilleries that were allowed to exist in the United States. You could get whiskey by prescription from your doctor. <laughs> and one of them was in Windbrook Road in Town. It's the site of the old Baltimore Colts train. There was a distillery up there. One night, the distillery was robbed. A 
guard was shot and died. And Henry Bletzer was found a couple of blocks from the scene with $10,000 in his pocket. Back then, they didn't have the RICO statute, so they didn't pin the murder on him, but they got a conspiracy charge on him and spent, was sentenced to 10 months in jail. He served about six. Um, while in jail, there was a scandal because the guards kept bringing him alcohol. <laughs> and one night he was evidently singing outside of his cell or something out the window or something to um, Like I said, he, he was a popular guy. Anyway, so that's what was left of, of Bond Street. Weakened the whole house to the point where a few years later they had to tear the house down. So thought, put it still a house Yes. <laughs> you probably wouldn't need a 500 gallon still. That's a lot. Okay. We'll see if you, you're, so, you're going to see K.O. Cheney. Don't worry, I got it. Yeah. Go back to um, hit, hit the off button. Oh. The dot in the middle, not that one. As I said, he, he had continuing scrapes with the law. He owned a hotel up in um, Charles and Mont Royal Avenue. It was called the Hotel Winton. And the Winton was a place, if you were having an evening out with your wife, you'd take her to the Lord Baltimore. If you were having an evening out with your girlfriend, you'd take her to the Hotel Winton. Um, he was hanging around, minding his own business one day in 1924 out in front of the hotel when three or four cops just walked out to beat the crap out of him. And he couldn't understand why. So his activities continued. Like I said, in 1928, they found another big cache of liquor on his land. He was indicted this time, and he disappeared. He showed up about three, three months later, went to court, and had the charges dismissed again. He knew a lot of people, he knew a lot of judges. By about 1930, he was living full time down on North Point Road, Fletcher Road. In the 1933, prohibition was repealed. Happy days, we're here again. So what Henry Bletcher does is he goes back to boxing. And the sports writers are like, hey, guess who's back? Does that for a couple of years. Gets busted for gambling again. Nothing really happened to him. But by this time, he was sick. And he died in 1937. He was 48 years old. Bring that up. That's George Chang. I'll find it. Kid William. George Cheney was left handed, by the way. That's his house. We're almost to his death. That's Bond Street. That's, that's George Cheney. That's Kid William. Keep talking and I'll find it. His name is also John Kuchenko. And where was he from? 
Ukraine. 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 <laughs> This house. Now I'm oh, right here. Yeah, it just takes a minute. I know. We had a lot of trouble with that. Brandon, let me know. It's not my problem. <laughs> okay. I'm That's short chain. I can't. Here. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Am I the only one that knows how to do it? Yes, <laughs> so you it well. We haven't established that either. Right? I'm telling you, they're all unlocked. I don't know what it is. Are they unlocked on the next page, too? No. See? You got them all checked. I'm going to get fired for my high pay and volunteer. <laughs> Please don't kick me off the island. Okay. There you go. Now. All right. And now I should come up. Yes. Okay. I get to see. We'll keep you around for another, for another day. Just for a little bit. <laughs> so this is his grave in Oak Lawn Cemetery. Oh, that's fun. Oak Lawn, by the way, manages our graveyard here yes. at Todd's Inheritance. And the, the tagline I say is that money won't buy into heaven, but it'll buy a damn nice tombstone. Yeah. <laughs> and the rest of his family is, is in there very with them, too. Um, and the, like I said, he, he was not, he was an interesting, colorful guy. I wouldn't say he was a good guy. It's an interesting story that um, isn't very well known. So I have some, a couple of boards here with some of his exploits on them. Um, I wouldn't ask her to pull up another picture, but there's <laughs> <laughs> a picture of him at, at 45. He's about 45 years old at the time of this picture. See how old he is. How he aged from this one to this one. Lived a hard life. Do you have any questions? I do. Why is it so not well known? Because I handled the Facebook publicity, and um, you know, I was trying to look for him, and thank <laughs> goodness I have you to email because I could find nothing except was, a picture of this person. It's weird. The only reason I found it is that one of Rob's neighbors came in the historical society one day mm -hmm. and was asking about the Japanese fishing trip. And he said that he thought there were Japanese characters on one of the piers or something like that. They had a nickname for him in the neighborhood. I don't know what I'm but, um, and when I looked it up, I did find that, but then I started finding things about Henry Bletcher come up. So that's the only reason I know about it. There's a book called Baltimore Prohibition. He's not mentioned. They mentioned the Gwynbrook Distillery robbery, but they don't mention him in relation to it. Um, his obituaries don't mention his time selling liquor. Um, one of the reasons he died May 6th of 1937, and the next day the Hindenburg blew up. So his obituaries were somewhat truncated by the fact that there was all sorts of coverage of the Hindenburg blowing up. But um, it's weird. And it, he will get an occasional mention when you like old boxing um, yeah, magazines and find things. The Kid Williams and Kid Williams K. And, and K. O. Cheney, who've seen about eighteen times. But I could never <laughs> find I, I could never find a picture of him. No. The know. only pictures of him are, are in the paper. He never or, married. His, he did marry. Um, his wife uh, remarried after he died. His daughter married a stockbroker. Uh, one of the weird little footnotes of that is his his wife must have hired a um, publicist when the daughter got married because her wedding announcements in like a hundred different newspapers. So it's really strange. And um, she died in 1981. I think she she married a couple more times. I think that was one of her married names and that was another one, I think. But 
she's buried with him. Um, she also came from a good German family. Um, he had two sisters who didn't seem to want to have much to do with him. Maybe because he blew up his parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a family story that I saw somewhere, and I, I don't have any corroboration for it at all, is that Henry's mother either had an affair or was sexually assaulted. And that explains why Henry wasn't like the rest of the world. But that's, like I said, that's completely uncorroborated. <coughs> but he was different. And there's nothing, I found nothing about him until, I think it's 1910, when all of a sudden he's managing these guys and, and going around the country. And, um, he was into gambling also. But um, he was enough of a, they call him a sportsman, that when something would come up, like they interviewed him about when the Black Sox do the World Series, they talked to him about that locally and he gave some points in the paper. Um, general state of sports, uh, there's an article in 25 where they talk about Jack Dunn, who was the manager of the Orioles, and then Henry Bletzer about something. Um, like I said, in his day, he was a very famous guy. And very little, um, very little accountability. Didn't, you could almost say the crime paid. Right? It is crazy that he was able to get off. And you said he he knew like um, many, like many judges. He knew a lot of judges. I think a lot of them like to gamble. Yeah. Um, his rat skeller on Baltimore Street. They said that people would assemble and do barbershop singing. Uh, go all night and just do a barbecue. So great. And a lot of people. Yeah. Um, What's the translation for Rat Skeller? Rat Skeller is. Um, Solid. Yeah, it's. German. Yeah, the German is. I majored in German in college, so I have no excuse not to have an answer. For it. But it, it was like in the basement of a building. A beer cellar. The Skeller was like cellar, right? Yeah. And of course, during Prohibition, they couldn't serve alcohol. Do you believe that? Some of the <clears throat> restaurants that still exist in the area, um, one of them is Squires. Um, Mr. Ramiti told me one time that there is like a sub basement to Squires. Everybody familiar with Squires? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That where. Before the last renovation where you would go to get your table, there was a, and there's actually a false floor there. And that, that's where they keep the booze. And when the cops showed up, they just sink the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't they keep that? That's such a great historical thing to keep. Yeah. Also, it's, it's He also smart. has, and I put this in one of my newsletters a couple of years ago. Um, have you ever been to the upstairs room of Squires? Yeah. When they were doing their last renovation, probably 1988, they took, opened up one of the walls and found a huge chalkboard of racing results, horse races. And I looked it up, it's actually from January 5th of 1929. And um, some of it is still legible. And they think that it was a backup site, maybe, to somebody else's place. But I read another account that um, from, a, from an old jockey that they used to call, well, let me tell you the whole story. This jockey raced in Canada, and he had, up until recently, he had the record for the most winning horses in a row. So when somebody broke that record, they did it article on him. And he had told an interviewer that he was racing up in Canada and the horse that he was racing, the owner had purposely held back. Previously didn't want the horse to win. He was getting right from the animals. One day he went to the track and the owner said, let, let her go this time. So he knew the horse was going to win. So he called his father in Baltimore and his, told his father to bet everything he had on this horse. 
mortgage your house. Credit on this one. So the place his father went was Schwab. And they said on the streetcar that instead of calling out um, either Hollabird Avenue or Shell Road, they'd call out Racetrack when they got there. <laughs> <laughs> and guys would come out with a race. And if the father won so much money that Fred Squires had to go to the bank next day. And Fred Squires was also a boxing promoter and a gambler a little bit later than he was. He wasn't as successful as he was. And when the Remedies bought it, they kept the name. Fred Squires was an actual person. And if you're in the bar at Squires, you can see some couple pictures of Fred Squires. that I tend to meander around subjects and so I start talking about something and I mean 14 other things it's easy to get and eventually come back to it a couple hundred pages later and it'll be very hard to find. This is very fascinating. Now, I think that this would be an excellent local book. I am amazed that there isn't. Like yeah. you said, when you look him up, Google, you don't find anything I did except a little bit about these two guys. I did Google, I did like Amazon, I did like every search engine. But if you go to newspapers.com, yeah. it'll all pop It'll be in there. Because all I could get was the place where his um, his family lived. Yeah. That was the place where he was born. And then I went and looked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's no information like, up on that either. Yeah, no. Like, I'll find a grave. I, I did find a grave, but yeah. I, like, I would rather just come to take my own photo just in case, copyright, you yeah. know. Yes. Was there a, uh, an organized crime family that ran, ran Baltimore? Yeah. Some people would say their name's D'Alessandro. <laughs> <laughs> I right. wouldn't go there. <laughs> I'm also a Democrat, so I really wouldn't go there. Um, was there like a, like were they controlled by any of the Italian families in New York? Yeah. As far as anybody knows, he knows. But um, as they said on the wire one time, they were running their drug operation by Robert's Rules of Orders, and the guy was taking minutes. <laughs> the boss ripped it up and said some words I can't say, but you don't take minutes of a criminal organization. <laughs> so who exactly he might have reported to, how exactly under what license he might have been operating? It's hard to say. Um, it seems to me like he was doing most of it on his own. Okay. But I don't, I have never heard, I've never heard of him, but I've never heard of any big bootleggers. Like there are stories one of the ladies was telling uh, Linda, who was listening in about people growing, you know, in, taking stuff in rowboats and going from Essex to, to here and um, working small caches like that. Um, but nothing anywhere near a scale like this. Kevin, we do have a comment online. It says he agrees you should start writing a book. <laughs> Vince, is it you? <laughs> no, Vince wouldn't be online. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but he was supposedly a very generous person. Yeah, you'd, you'd said that in one of your previous um, talks. That he's very generous to people in need. So I don't know exactly where that was or how that was. Um, but, and he's been gone, you know, since 1937. So anybody who would know him is most likely gone too. The closest is some of Rob's relatives, like he had caretakers and things, and people who drove for him. Um, and and some of their descendants lived in Rob. Sure he died when age 45? 48. 48. Was it alcohol related death? We can assume so. <laughs> that he was not only a president, he was also a client. <laughs> <laughs> we had a sample one time. 
more than himself. Yeah. Right. And he lived, like I said, he, he was larger than life. So, um, Thank you. when the military was down here in Fort Howard, right. we weren't allowed to sell alcohol within five months. Right. Or I, I grew up down there, so I only remember one little bar restaurant. So maybe that's why it wasn't so prolific. Well, part of that has to do, it's a whole other story. When Sparrow's Point was laid out in the 1880s, um, there, was, there were two brothers. One of them ran the steel mill and the other one ran the town. His name was Rufus Wood. And he went to Sparrow's Point as a Rufus Wood Award. He got to high school to come in and everything. He was anti-alcohol and banned it in the town. And every time somebody would try to get a liquor license off the Sparrow's Point, he would be there opposing it. So he was very successful from the 1880s into like early 1900s, banning alcohol. For a long time, the first place you could get a drink off of the point was the Monument House, which is where the fellow Ramble happened. Old North Point Road. One stream was. It was one stream. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, if you were into that kind of stuff. That was a strip club. Yeah. Um, you remember the Monument House? Yeah. That was its last incarnation that I but the Monument House has probably been there since the 1830s. And the Butchke family, and then there was a family after that, Rob probably knows this, they were the ones who took care of the Akilah Randall Mountain, because it was on their property over there. And the county, or nobody, took ownership of it. It was a place that they were kind of left. And uh, I can't remember that. The, the guy who bought the Monument House when the Butchkees finally said, he also, he, Restored it one time, and, but yeah, that was that was about the closest place you could get a drink. This is pre Mickey's, of course. I read that down at Fort Howard that during Prohibition, <coughs> the, the soldiers, each company would have a club, and they would actually rent a place in town. Oh. And of course, then, then they would go down there and do it. And I'm guessing maybe some bootleggers they got here. That would be pretty easy. Coming right yes, around. And that's how they got it. Could have got it from the guys at Hollaberg. <laughs> Probably. Because yes. they were actually running that still there for a while. Was the Balcom Club involved in any of this? I mean, this was right not far from the port. So, um, I don't know. Is I'm it that old? That was a private How house. old is that? Was, oh, that was a private club? Yeah. No, a house. Oh, ha oh a house. house. Oh, okay. But like, like I said, the, the whole. What's Tolliver Avenue now, Wise Avenue? Um, well, it's just littered with bars and shores, beer halls. Um, it's kind of funny when you read the, the articles from the 1890s. They talk about kids going up and down the street, like driving their horses as fast as they can, and nobody has any concern for law and order. And this used to be a nice town, and now it's crap. And nothing ever changed. I mean, it's all like, you go down through the generations. There was a couple of old, um, in St. Helena, there was a couple of twins, ladies, they were like 86 years old, and they interviewed them in 1925. So they were born in like the 1840s. And they were complaining about the women of today, they have vacuum cleaners. The only way to get a rug clean is to take it out and beat it. You know, this is cheap, and they have dishwashers. And they have washing machines, you know, good things. And they wear their skirts too short, and they're all out dancing all night. And they're not doing And it's just like, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's the way things don't change sometimes. Right. Um, but the, there was a very famous murder. Well, it wasn't a murder, actually. A um, guy was in Campbell's Hotel. He was having a drink, and one of his neighbors walked. And the neighbors, whether he was his stepson or his housekeeper's son, was never fully clear. And the relationship between the neighbor and the housekeeper was never fully clear. But this was the kid who would steal your chickens. This was the kid who would be, always be on your property. This was the kid who was the neighborhood band. And he was out hunting one day, and he had a bird, bird gun, and he was twirling it on the way back. And it discharged and hit him in a very sensitive spot. <laughs> So he wound up in the hospital, and then his stepfather slash housekeeper's uh, 
pen walked in the camels, and the guy made a joke about his kid. Uh, and you can imagine what it related to. And the guy says, well, you come over to my house, and I'll tell you. Showed up at his house, and the guy shot him dead in the shot. And he held the shotgun to keep anybody from coming away and giving him anything. And these things were in the paper day after day after day. So finally, the guy um, got convicted of manslaughter. Wound up getting 30 days in jail. The boy dies. But yeah. So, some things change and some things don't. So, that's a lesson of history. It's constantly repeating itself. Socrates said the same thing. What's that? Socrates said the same thing. And a lot of other people are. He was the first. think he was the first? He's probably a caveman said the same thing. <laughs> Any other questions? What was the most favorite? I, well, gin was easiest to make, if you want to understand. Um, scotch was very popular. Um, Canadian Club Whiskey was available. Rum, they call them rum runners. It could come from anywhere. A lot of it would come from the Caribbean, anywhere you could get it up from. People had um, an insatiable appetite for alcohol. That people like Henry were happy to support. Can I say something? Sure. This place has never been so crowded and so liquid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the Todd's. Like the Todd's, unlike most of their neighbors, were Presbyterians, right? Right. And Thomas Todd, they said, liked to have a little nip on some more. So oh, he stop. <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't as opposed to it as most of his neighbors. The Merritts were big time Methodists, the Lynches. Um, the Gorsuches were kind of, which is kind of weird because one of the Gorsuches was police commissioner for several years, early 1900s. And they were constantly ragging him because he wasn't too um, vigilant with his alcohol enforcement, even though he was one of their people. And then there were people like the Du Bois, who um, <laughs> Mary's great grandfather. He would be an interesting book too. Um, the things, the things that happened over there on Swan Harbor. Um, are also very interesting. Do you have one more question? I, I did. It was actually um, near um, in the Dundalk area. There was a another restaurant called was it Brentwood. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think that's the one. And it had a basement. It, uh, it had a wine cellar. And it was very old. And I was just kind of just trying to I don't think it's that old, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it, I mean, I don't know what it is now. Yeah. But Squires started sometime in the 20s. Squires started as a pool hall. Um, and gradually, um, they started serving food and stuff. And Fred Squires died in the 40s, and then they sold the place to the Romini family. I just didn't know if the Brentwood, the, I don't think that the they Brentwood had that wine that cell old. that was used previously um, for something else. It's a church now. One of the things I've heard is that the airport grill was founded after Prohibition, but Mr. Rule used to brew it in the basement and serve people to us. And the Inslees were cute. Anybody know anything about the Inslees? They were St. Helena family. Were allegedly some of the big numbers people were in. And they were involved in some of this too. And my mother told me the first time I gave it, you better not talk about the Endless because they might have you killed. <laughs> and I said, Mother, you know, I think they don't give a rat's ass what happened 100 years ago. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> If there's no other questions, feel free to come up and, and look at some of this stuff. So, good job. Another great lecture. I love the way it turns into a chat. All of the lectures are the same way. It's so interesting. We learn so much. Um, so, 
if you want to find Kevin at certain times, go to the Tapsco Neck Historical Society, one of our partners in telling great historical stories from the area. Um, a plug for next weekend is Defender's Day down at Fort Howard, and I think it's 9 to 4 or 9 to 5, something like that. 10 to 5. Oh, 10 to 5. Okay, 10 to 10. Um, Todd's will be open, uh, not for formal tours, but you can come in. There's no admission, and just walk on the first floor, see the graveyard and the tool shed. And now our shameless uh, ask here is, you know, we are a nonprofit at Todd's Inheritance, and we operate on donations. So if you like what we're doing, if you enjoy our presentations, and you'd like to help us continue, uh, you can go on our Facebook page and get our address and information on how you can help us. So again, Kevin, thank you very much. It was wonderful, a little challenging, but uh, it was wonderful. <laughs> thank you, guys.